This video is sponsored by Skillshare. And yet another example of me spending too much time on Twitter, my feed blew up last week over this thread from Lemonade AI, an insurance company that claimed to be able to detect whether or not someone was filing a fraudulent insurance claim using artificial intelligence. And while they went on to delete the original thread, post an apology thread, and generally backtrack pretty hard, it raised a question that seems to keep coming up in the field of artificial intelligence. Can we actually use AI to detect emotions in the first place? I've done a couple of videos on this topic on my channel, so if you're new here, consider subscribing and checking out the other videos on the playlist that I'll link up here. But to talk about whether or not artificial intelligence systems can detect emotions, we should probably talk about how we detect emotions as people. In fact, let's start with an example. Leave a comment below with the range of emotions that you think that I've experienced so far in this video. Done? All right. So if I were to look back at this video so far, I would say that my emotions in this video have ranged from being a bit annoyed with this company that is making fraud detection software using artificial intelligence to generally happy and content and excited to talk to you about this topic today. And when I prompted you to leave a comment below, I might say that I was feeling curious or inquisitive because I wanted to know what all of you thought. In reality though, throughout all of those clips, I would describe myself as feeling stressed, tired, and kind of annoyed. Why? Well, if you follow me on Instagram or you're subscribed to my Substack newsletter, you probably know that I'm taking my PhD qualifying exam one week from when this video goes live. And you might use that context to guess that I am feeling a bit anxious, that that anxiousness might be making it hard for me to sleep, which is making me tired, and that I'm a little bit annoyed because I've been revising a presentation for three weeks now and would really just like to get it over with. And this is all to say that as humans, recognizing each other's emotions isn't as simple as looking at each other's faces. The context in which that observation occurs, as well as any background or outside information we might have that informs it influences our perception of other people's emotions. In fact, the research backs this up. There are studies that have shown that if you show a person a face with a neutral expression on it followed by a second image, their interpretation of the emotion displayed in that first photo is correlated with the contents of the second one. For example, if the first photo is of a woman with a neutral expression and the second photo is of a baby, people are more likely to think that the woman is displaying compassion or an emotional response correlated to protectiveness over the child. We also know from the research that cultural context matters. While there are similarities in how emotions are expressed across cultures, there are also differences that can cause misinterpretation of emotional responses. There's also just societal bias. Studies have shown that faces of people of color are more likely to be interpreted as displaying negative emotions, even when you control for the actual expressions shown in the images, such as smiling. Interestingly, as I researched this more, it reminded me of a statistical method called Bayesian inference, which is essentially a method of predicting the likelihood of a certain event based on both the evidence presented before you as well as your prior knowledge of that event and the surrounding context. In this case, when we look at people's expressions to try to understand their underlying emotions, we're performing something called reverse inference. Our goal is to use something that we can observe the evidence, which is their facial expression, to determine an unseen underlying state, which is their actual emotions in that moment. And when we do it as humans, we're making a few assumptions, namely that that person's expression is actually related to their internal emotional state, which would be the likelihood in Bayesian inference. And we're relying on our priors about that person, their expression, the context that generated that expression, and any other evidence we might have to try to make that inference. And I don't bring up this equation to show you some math. I bring it up to point out that when we try to translate this approach, try to translate emotion recognition to artificial intelligence systems, we lose a lot of information in the process. AI-based emotion recognition still uses the evidence, which comes from the images themselves. You can develop mathematical markers that represent whether or not someone is smiling using different image processing techniques, as well as that likelihood function, which inherently assumes that someone smiling is linked to them being happy. However, there are two important pieces of information that we lose when we transition to AI systems. One of them is in that likelihood function, which you can normally update as you understand more about the situation and have more encounters with other situations that are related. So 
If you have a friend who always smiles when they are frustrated or angry, your likelihood function would update to say that someone smiling isn't actually that indicative of them being happy, and so the emotion on their face doesn't necessarily represent their internal emotional state. The other thing we lose is our priors. So we don't have that cultural context, we don't have the situational context to understand that a certain facial expression in one culture will mean one thing, and a facial expression in a different culture will mean another thing. We also don't have anything that might counter that bias in our image data. As we talked about earlier, photos of people of color are more likely to be disproportionately labeled as displaying negative emotion, even when you control for the actual emotion shown. And if that's how we've labeled our data set, then that's what's going to be propagated by the model itself. And this is all discussed in a review paper that came out in 2019, which essentially pushes back pretty hard against the claim that AI systems can be used to perform emotion detection. And I'll say now we focus mostly on image-based emotion detection in this video, but all of these claims also apply to speech-based emotion detection as well, which is addressed in that paper. So now that we know that these systems don't really reliably work and are used in spite of that, you might be curious about where you might encounter them in your daily life. We've talked about some of these in the past, including HireVue, the company that uses artificial intelligence systems to monitor your emotions during interviews and uses that metric to determine whether or not you are a suitable candidate, as well as in the context of AI proctoring, where facial recognition, among other things, were used to determine whether or not a student was performing suspicious behaviors. Interestingly, Proctorio, which is one of the big AI proctoring companies, actually recently decided that they would no longer use artificial intelligence in their system, citing concerns that teachers weren't actually reviewing the flagged footage that the system had picked up on and instead were allowing it to penalize students unfairly, which is ironic. Within the industry, Affectiva is probably the biggest company that focuses solely on emotion recognition. Most major tech companies have APIs that allow for this kind of application, including Microsoft. And they were recently acquired by a company called SmartEye, which makes autonomous driver monitoring systems for cars. Interestingly, Affectiva CEO agrees with a lot of the criticism of emotion monitoring within the field and has highlighted the fact that their company has gathered data sets across countries and cultures in an effort to create a data set that is actually representative of the full span of how people express emotions. On the more concerning side of things though, there's been recent reports that the Chinese government has been using these types of systems to profile Chinese Muslims in order to determine whether or not they are performing suspicious behaviors. And given the Chinese government's history with the younger Muslim population, that probably doesn't bode well. Somewhat unsurprisingly, there's no real current regulation of these systems, like most AI systems. And in a lot of cases, their use isn't actually being disclosed. So you might not have realized when you were recording a video interview for a job application that that video would go on to be processed using artificial intelligence to determine whether or not you were trustworthy. Interestingly though, the lead co-author of that paper that stated that we can't reliably use algorithmic systems to detect people's emotions also told The Verge that she thinks that we will eventually be able to do so reliably once we develop better biomarkers and better measurement systems. And I find that opinion to be very interesting, primarily because I feel like it conflicts with a lot of the issues brought up in the paper itself, in addition to the fact that other platforms such as Emojify, which I'll include a link in the description for, have shown that you can make an emotion recognition system believe that you are experiencing a particular emotion when you objectively aren't. In short, artificial intelligence systems haven't quite cracked the code of human emotions. In fact, I would argue that humans haven't cracked the code of human emotions on most days. But chances are you're still going to encounter these systems as you move forward through life, whether you know it or not. On the upside, the fact that algorithms haven't cracked the code of human creativity and emotions leaves more opportunities for the rest of us. From writing novels that tug at your heartstrings to editing engaging videos, there are a ton of places for you to flex your creativity. In fact, if you'd like to learn how to make YouTube videos from a true master of the craft, you should check out Marquez Brownlee's Skillshare course on YouTube success, where you'll learn how to create videos that connect with your audience, whether you have one follower or 100,000. If that sounds interesting to you, you should join Skillshare, an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey for less than $10 per month. They offer thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people, so if YouTube videos aren't your thing, you can explore topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. 
Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, so there's no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes like Thomas Frank's course on productivity and creativity. In fact, I make a guest appearance in the bonus interviews for Skillshare premium members, so head on over to check that out. Skillshare members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with hands-on projects and feedback from a community of millions. And most classes are under 60 minutes with short lessons to fit any schedule. So if you'd like to support my channel and develop your creative skills this year, you can click on the link in the description to join Skillshare. In fact, the first 1,000 people to click on that link will get 30% off the annual Skillshare premium membership so that you can explore your creativity. Otherwise, if you like this video, let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out the videos that I've done on HireVue, as well as AI proctoring to learn more about how companies are using emotion recognition AI to try to figure out whether or not you are a fraud. If you want to follow my PhD life, you can do so on Instagram and TikTok, and otherwise I'll see you all on Monday. Bye!